Were you aware that our modern alphabet is based on ancient African wall art? I know, I know, it sounds really crazy, but what would you say if I told you that our modern letter M used to be an owl, or our modern letter D used to be a hand, and this one's really strange. How about how Egyptian houses ended up becoming not one, but two letters in our modern alphabet? I know, sounds a little bit far-fetched, but do bear with me and join me on this journey as we dot the I's and cross the T's and uncover the secrets of our modern A to Z. Z. It is largely accepted that the Greek alphabet was a direct adaptation of the Phoenician version with a couple of added letters to complement the regional quirks of Indo-European phonetics. We'll get into that more a little later. The term alphabet is actually unique to the Greek variant and its Latin offspring since that was the first to be called, well, an alpha, bet. Um, we'll also get into that later. The Phoenician variant was instead called an abjad, a writing system that includes symbols primarily for consonants. So, to continue with our tale, it was the Greek alphabet, in turn, that was adopted and adapted to form the Etruscan alphabet. The Etruscans, who lived in the region of modern-day Tuscany, Italy, adopted their alphabet from the Greeks, specifically from the Greek colonies in southern Italy around the 8th century BCE. The Greek settlers brought their alphabet to Italy where the Etruscans adapted it to their own language, which was non-Indo-European and significantly different from Greek. The Etruscan alphabet included symbols for sounds not present in Greek but necessary for Etruscan phonology, with Etruscan belonging to the isolated Tyrsenian language family. There'll be more on that later. This included the addition of sounds like F, and variants of the S sound, there'll be more on that later also. The Latin-speaking peoples who lived in close proximity to the Etruscans then adopted and further modified the Etruscan alphabet for their own use, creating the early form of the Latin alphabet. This adaptation included changes to accommodate the sounds of the Latin language, which was Indo-European. Some letters that were unnecessary for Latin were dropped, while others were added or modified to represent sounds not found in either Etruscan or Greek. It is this same database of letters that has evolved over the centuries into the modern 26-letter alphabet, today used in English and most other European languages. In fact, it's the most widely used alphabet in the modern world. The end. Well, it could be other than the fact this version of the story misses out on some minor details. The main one being that without Africa, none of these scripts would even exist today, certainly not in the form that we're accustomed to. In fact, I would go as far as to say all of these scripts have a recent and traceable origin back to the African continent. Historically, Western academics and historians have been notably reluctant to give credit to this important African contribution, especially when it comes to a subject of such importance as the conception of language and writing across Europe and the Mediterranean. In many ways, it's understandable that they're so protective of the Latin alphabet. After all, this combination of 21 consonants and five vowels has very much become a symbol of Western global domination. Africa to Asia to South America, all choosing to write out their native tongues using this Latin alphabet because they know everyone is going to understand if it's written in this format. However, it may be surprising to some, but the origination of the Latin alphabet can be firmly traced back to the African continent. To begin, let's gain a better understanding of the Nile Valley and how, at least 7,000 years ago, this African collective began to form the first known phonetic lexicon, which culminated in ancient Egyptian Medu Neta, the language of the gods, more commonly known as hieroglyphics. 
Now, the ancient Egyptian script actually consists of three iterations, these being hieroglyphic, which is the pictographic script we're all familiar with, and which, before the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, historians considered to be nothing more than primitive African wall art. Next came Hieratic, which was a shorthand version of the hieroglyphic pictographic script. Its conception and use were almost simultaneous with the invention and increasing popularity of another important breakthrough, Papyrus. Given the increasing ability and need to keep documents as scripts due to the complex socio-political arrangements that were continuing to form in Kemet, the scribes found ways to abbreviate the written art form of hieroglyphics in order to produce transcripts faster. The third iteration of the ancient Egyptian written language is demotic. Demotic is even more simplified and abstract than hieratic with a reduction in the number of strokes per symbol. It represented a further evolution towards a script that could be written quickly and efficiently for everyday use. However, concerning our study is a combination of hieroglyphic and hieratic scripts that formed the basis of so much of what became the modern Latin alphabet. Now, the Egyptian pictorial language actually consists of three main groups. The first type of hieroglyphic or pictograph that you'll come across is a logogram. Now, a logogram essentially is a picture or a graphic that symbolizes a thing. So, you know, you might have a picture of a bird that is that particular bird or an animal or a building, and you're literally having pictures of things. Now, the next type is an ideograph. Now, these ones are incredibly common. This is where you are actually portraying or displaying some kind of a concept. So you can have things like this hippo apt actually gave us the concept of heavies. Now, the last group that we have are phonetics. So phonetics are essentially broken up into two groups, alphabetics and syllabics. Alphabetics, as you can imagine, work in a similar way as the alphabet. So we have this little um, symbol here that gives us the letter P and here's the name for Ptolemy or at least I should say Ptolemus, who was one of the first Greek rulers in ancient Egypt. So we can see his name here, P-T-O, uh, yeah, you get the picture. But also we can have syllabics, which give us more like sounds. So for instance, we have this ox's head, which gives us the sound ah. And actually that's probably a really good way to start. The ancient Egyptian phonetic lexicon consists of numerous polyphonic and homophonic symbols. It was formed from selected glyphs that were only used for the sound produced by the first letter of the word being depicted. We know that from words like mulok, the ancient Egyptian word for the African spotted eagle owl. As a result, the same creature is used for the symbol representing M. However, some of these alphabetics origins are unknown and this will become very relevant later. So here's an A to Z walkthrough letter by letter or symbol by symbol on how these ancient Egyptian symbols have indirectly influenced the Phoenician language and other Aegean languages. In ancient Egyptian, when it came to phonetics, whether or not they were alphabetic or syllabic, we know that the thing that we use to symbolize that phonetic would start with that sound. So for instance, if we look back at our ox example that gives us the sound ah we know that the sound for an ancient egyptian ox would have been ah however when it comes to the phoenicians who took on this letter their name for a ox is aleph so the phoenicians took on aleph or ah and they converted our image of an ox to this which then was turned to this by the greeks we get our modern letter B from the Phoenician symbol bet, which means house. So after a few minor aesthetic variations, you can see how we got to the Latin B. And if you're paying attention, there you have the first two letters of the Greek alphabet or the Phoenician Aleph Beth, depending on which side of the sea you hail from. Now, on an important side note, the symbol for bet was taken directly from the Egyptian symbol het, which also meant house in the ancient Egyptian language. However, since the Egyptians said het in line with their protocol, this phonetic in Egyptian 
gave you the ha huh sound rather than the ba. But we're not done with het there. In fact, this same Egyptian word also contributed to another important letter. I wonder if you can guess which it is. Now, the story of D is actually a really interesting one because the D has been likened to the Phoenician door and fish, but none of these glyphs really fit what eventually became the letter D. However, if we look at the ancient Egyptian hand symbol, which actually does give us the sound D, it doesn't look much like a D now, but if we look at the hieratic version of this, you can easily see how this symbol, once turned upwards, eventually became the letter D. Now, the letter C, on first glance, seems to have a rather more mundane origin than other letters, allegedly originating as this simple Egyptian bowl symbol turned on its side and with its handle lost. Egyptians, Phoenicians and Etruscans bore the hallmarks of common phonetic origins, in that they all had multiple variations for the ka sound. However, it suddenly becomes interesting again when we look at the letter G. The Romans, who shared an Indo-European tongue with the Greeks, decided to resurrect gamma, whereas the Etruscan language, like their Afro-Asiatic neighbours, combined ka and ga sounds into a single symbol. So instead of using the letter C for both, the letter G was later introduced into the Latin alphabet as a modification of C to represent the G sound, a development attributed to Spurius Carvilius Ruger around the 3rd century BCE, and the inspiration for its appearance, you ask? Well, that can be seen here in the hieratic version of the Egyptian bowl, but with the re-inclusion of the once lost handle, fascinating. Now, E began as this man with his hands up shouting, well, if you have a look at him, he looks like he's shouting, hey, and that's exactly what he was doing in the ancient Egyptian language. He was shouting, hey. Now, what happened is the ancient Greeks then took this on from the Phoenician form and they dropped the H and they called the letter Epsilon, which essentially means naked E because they had stripped it from its H. So, hey became A or E, and that's how we got the letter E. As for the letter F, on initial inspection, it seems unrelated to the horned viper hieroglyph it originates from. However, in hieratic, the serpent was stood up with its horns emphasized, producing the same letter and sound found in the Egyptian, Etruscan, and, of course, our modern Latin alphabet. Interestingly, the same Serastis hieroglyph also became the basis for the Phoenician War, which was modified to become the Greek Upsilon, the parent of several letters, of course, including Y. Etruscans, like the Afroasiatic speakers, used a single symbol for all of the characters in this Upsilon family, while the Latin speakers fragmented it systematically to represent both the vowel, semi-vowels, and the consonant sounds of U, Wu, U, and Va, leading to the additions of U, V, W, and Y in the Latin script. Now, the letter H is really interesting. Do you remember way back when we spoke about the letter B and the fact that it came from the ancient Egyptian Het, which became Bet in Phoenician. Well, we're back at Het again. But Het, interestingly enough, has two symbols in ancient Egyptian because this is once again the homophonic nature of the language. So Het, when it's used in its alphabetic form, looks like this, which looks like the Phoenician Bet. But Het, when it's used in its ideographic form, looks like this. It looks like a bounding box. It doesn't have that little opening which makes it the sound or the syllabic letter. So this het, which we can see in words like het heru, we can see all of these words have this bounding box around it. Now all that happened is when this transferred to the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians used the same word but not for house anymore but they use it for a courtyard wall and they simply added an internal wall to this courtyard wall to get their het, which as you can see, they knocked off the bottom and the top, and that became the letter H. But both the letter B and H have their origins in the ancient Egyptian word het. 
Now, K is another letter that has a very interesting origin. If we look at the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph for the K sound, there are many different ways of getting the K sound. We get it from this, 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 that's that polyphonic nature of ancient Egyptian. So homophonic. That's the homophonic nature of the ancient Egyptian language playing around with us again. However, if we look at this symbol, this tent symbol, we can see something that looks very familiar and very similar to modern K. And actually, if we transfer over to the Phoenician hand symbol, I think it's deliberately in line with this ancient Egyptian tent symbol. But either way, that's our origin for the letter K. L descends from a laying lion for those that enjoy an alliterative approach. The hieratic version formed this squiggly line which lost its head and tail with the Phoenicians. This happened before it was finally straightened out by the Etruscans and Romans. Now, M has always been my favourite ancient Egyptian symbol, and that's likely because it was the first one I learnt. And it was likely the first one I learnt because it was very easy to learn. Because if you look at this symbol of an owl, it actually has an M on its brow ridge. And this is very, very consistent throughout all ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So this symbol of an owl gives us the letter M. And if we look at the hieratic version of the letter M, you can see it's simply, they've kept that brow ridge, but they've turned it slightly on its side. So we have that letter M. Now the ancient Egyptian symbol for the letter N is this squiggly line that symbolizes water, which ironically is what the Phoenicians use for their letter M. But either which way, we only need a section of this squiggly water line to be able to build our modern day N, which is exactly what was handed to the Phoenicians and then to the Greeks. Now the letter S is really interesting because we actually have two symbols for the letter S in both languages and both seem to have been preserved and both seem to be related. The cometic bolt was reflected in the Phoenician Samek pillar, while the cometic fish hook retained its name and form in the Phoenician Sade. The Egyptians, Phoenicians and Etruscan languages all possessed a variety of sibilant or hissing sounds that were reflected in their scripts. This resulted in the use of multiple symbols for these variations in their respective alphabets. The Romans only had one S sound, and so collated and simplified these into the single letter S. Now the letter I, which later became the letter J, um, which was added much, much later, descends from the ancient Egyptian forearm and it's exactly the same thing in the Phoenician language as well. So here's your letter that eventually became the letter I. Now, to wrap this up, the letter P descends from the Semitic P, which became the Greek Pi. O descended from the Semitic Ayin, which was based on the Kemetic air symbol for pupil. This became Omicron in the Greek alphabet. T came from the Semitic cross mark or Tau Phoenician cross, which gave birth to Teth and the Greek Theta. X was a Greek addition called Chi, and well, I think that's it apart from one last letter. And finally, Probably my favourite letter is the letter Z because this one is one that has secret origins once again within the ancient Egyptian script. Now the letter Z, you can see how it descends from the Phoenician letter, which is almost exactly the same. You just got to kind of skew this middle line over slightly and you have the modern letter Z. But what I'm interested to know is where they got this letter Z in from. If we go back to the letter S used in ancient Egyptian, that's represented by this symbol here. However, when we see two of these S's together, the ancient Greeks would pronounce this as C's, such as the name Ramesses. However, on the African continent, these two S's together would be pronounced with a Z sound. We know that because they call Ramesses Romezo or Romez in the Kenya Rwandan language. If we look at these two symbols, essentially we have something similar to a Z but not quite there. And that's where the hieratic script would come in. Because in the hieratic script, they would draw the top stem, join it together and draw the bottom stem. And that is where you get something that's very similar, 
to the Phoenician Zayn and something very similar to what ended up becoming the Z or Zeta. So there you have it. There's the origin of our modern A to Z traceable all to Phoenician or directly to ancient Egyptian language. Now that we've covered the entire alphabet, you may have noted that Phoenicians seem to be the major contributor to Latin script, sometimes independently so. What isn't discussed is the recent African origin of the Mesopotamian and Phoenician languages. It's important to note the Mesopotamian and Phoenician languages were part of the Semitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic or Proto-Afrasian language group an African linguistic group with its roots deep within Nilo-Saharan Africa. The other branches of Afro-Asiatic are Berber, Chadic, Cushitic, Omotic, and of course, Ancient Egyptian. As you can see, all African languages, according to expert linguist Christopher Ayret, the birth of the Semitic branch itself can be traced back to around six to 7,000 years ago, not long before the birth of Mesopotamian civilization itself. So, as you can see, aside from a handful of letters modified by the Romans, a large bulk of the script we call the Latin script has identifiable and traceable origins to the African continent. This provides a wonderful continuity of language and thought that, through the Afro-Asiatic phylum, has permeated throughout the modern world to, in many ways, dictate our modern spoken and written languages. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that the entire Western world was aware that their written script was owed to and shared a common ancestor with its roots in Africa. In my view, this doesn't diminish the origins of Europe in any way, but rather it gives a nod to the beauty of human continuity and offers mankind an intriguing point of origination. It highlights the social adhesion that must have existed at some point for these ideas to have been diffused from one nation to the next. In many ways, it's warming to note how very closely we're all linked as members of the human race. Now finally, it's important to note here that no attempt is being made to suggest that the Indo-European languages of modern or ancient Greece or even Rome belong to the Afro-Asiatic language family inasmuch as Yoruba written in Latin script doesn't suddenly become an Indo-European or Afro-Asiatic language, but it does give us a very clear indication of the age and direction of influence in the region. It supports the work of linguist Christopher Ayret, who makes it clear that for millennia before our common era, Africa was indeed a net exporter of innovation and one of the oldest and perhaps greatest gifts of innovation Africa shared with the world was seemingly the gift of writing itself. Thank you for joining me on the King's Monologue. If you enjoyed the content, do subscribe as I have lots more like it. Thank you to my patron supporters and production team. If you're interested in joining us or supporting my research, do sign up using the Patreon link. And obviously, share this with someone who'd find it interesting.